Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers uh, for in inviting me to this lovely city. It's just beautiful. Um, I'm going to talk today about how we can uh, how we can think about models from neuroscience research in non-human animals and get insights into understanding human emotion in the brain. Um, and so the approach that we've, I've used throughout my career uh, is to think about emotion in the brain by first thinking about what we know about the representation of emotion in non-human animals. So in spite of the fact that we have much better techniques for studying the human brain now than we did 25 years ago, um, it's still the case that there are a lot of things we can't discover by studying the human brain. There's a lot of details of analysis um, that we can only uncover non-human animals. Um, and, but we can use that insight to study humans, and the techniques that we use in the lab, the approach that we use in my lab, is to take these models from non-human animals, and then initially try to conduct experimental paradigms that are as similar as possible to what we might um, see in other species and conduct them in humans and see, do we say, see the same brain systems involved? Um, but of course, ultimately, we don't care about whether uh, humans, the human brain looks like the rat brain. We care, does the human brain look like the human brain? Um, and so then we want to say, when we know something about these basic neural circuits, how do they extend to situations that may be more common or typical for human experience, the complex cultural, social environments uh, that we encounter? So that's the, um, the progression of my research that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to go back to animal models to use them as an inspiration for understanding humans um, in the study of emotion. Um, so one of the things that's come up quite a bit in this conference so far is how do we define emotion? And, and emotion, as all of you know, is not a, uh, a unitary process. There are numbers of ways of expressing um, components of emotion, such as subjective feelings, bodily responses, uh, expression in the, in, the, in the face and body. Emotion also motivates a tendency to action, to approach or avoid. Um, obviously, we're, I'm not going to cover all of those topics. What we've primarily done uh, to start the research program of studying emotion in the human brain uh, is to look at uh, objective measures, bodily responses, um, and primarily um, we've studied fear or negative affect. Uh, and the measure we've used more often than not is to look at physiological responding as measured by the skin conductance response. So I want to um, use this type of measurement, mostly focusing on arousal, but not um, exclusively, and try to understand something about emotion in the human brain, um, and then how this links to uh, cognition and social function. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with just uh, highlighting two principles. So one of the functions of emotion that you've heard something about so far in this conference is that emotion essentially tells us what is important for us. It tells us what's relevant for us. Um, and there should really be two principles that follow. Um, so if emotion is a cue to tell you what is relevant and what's important, um, emotion should be flexible. The, what's relevant to you today may not be relevant to you tomorrow. Um, so we should learn to, uh, to um, acquire emotional responses to some objects and then get rid of those emotional responses when they're no longer useful. Um, and emotion, if it tells you what's important to you, should color our, our thoughts and actions. Um, if, you know, our cognition should be tuned to become uh, heightenedly, become more, more aware of emotional events, we should remember things with emotional significance more, um, and they should influence the decisions we make. So the research I'm going to talk today, about today covers those two principles. Um, first, we're going to look about how emotion should be flexible. And I'll talk a little bit about how we acquire fear. And this is going to borrow very heavily from Joe Ledoux's uh, research that you heard about last night. Um, then I'm going to talk about how emotion might interact with, with cognition, so that emotion uh, colors our thoughts and actions. It colors our attention and colors our memory. And then I'm going to come back to how is it we can change emotional responses once we acquire them. So again, getting back to how emotion should be flexible. So first, to talk about how emotions, um, how objects and people acquire emotional significance. Joe Ledoux pointed to this last night, but Ivan Pavlov talked about simple association as one of the ways uh, that objects and people may acquire emotional significance, being associated with something um, positive or negative. And here is a slide I borrowed from Joe. Um, that you saw a version of last night, 
One of the ways we do this is simple classical conditioning. Um, we hear the rat, here's the tone, has no uh, particular emotional response. After a few pairings of the tone and the shock, uh, the, the tone itself elicits a range of emotional responses. And as Joe told you last night, the amygdala here in red and the images I will show you will look more like this um, is important for the acquisition, storage, and expression of this type of learning. So in our very first endeavors to try to look at the representation of emotion in the human brain, we wanted to ask the question, does the amygdala in human, humans do something similar? Um, so instead of playing auditory tones, we show them neutral stimulus like blue, uh, neutral stimuli like blue square. We pair that blue square with a mild shock to the wrist. After a few pairings, the blue square comes to elicit a, frame, a, a range of fear responses, and the primary one we measure is this change in the skin conductance response, an indication of autonomic nervous system arousal. And what we found, perhaps not surprisingly, is that we see robust um, activation of the amygdala using fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, when you're viewing a blue square that was paired with a shock, relative to, say, a yellow square that was never paired with shock. Patients with damage to the amygdala fail to show enhanced uh, arousal to a blue square that was paired with shock versus a yellow square that was never paired with shock. So this tells us, perhaps not surprisingly, that like other animals, the human amygdala is necessary for this bodily expression of fear learning. So that's useful to know that we are starting from the same basis. Um, but it doesn't really explain fears of things like this. So does anybody know what this is? Paul? Um, this is I took from a website that is used to teach children about germs. So germs are an interesting case, because um, the truth is our perceptual systems don't really pick up on germs. Yet, uh, we can develop robust fears of germs. Um, and this is a good example of the social communication of fear. And there are websites built to teach children to fear germs um, for health reasons. Uh, a few years ago, there was a virus going around in the United States, a flu called the H1N1 virus. At that time, my institution, New York University, put these little uh, hand sanitizers outside of all the elevators. So we had institutional fear of germs. Um, and you often see, uh, especially in in uh, Japan these days, individuals walking around um, with their faces covered because of other types of contaminants that they can't actually feel or have any physical uh, experience of. Um, so we want to ask this question, does the simple model of fear learning that we know quite a bit about from non-human animals apply to the social communication of fear? Um, so this is a cartoon version of the simple fear conditioning paradigm that I already described to you. This per individual fears the blue square because it's paired with a shock. If I, however, simply told you that when you see a blue square, you might get a shock, without ever giving you a shock, um, that will generate in you a fear response that is almost identical to the fear response um, that you would express if I actually paired a blue square with a shock. Um, and this just shows you that you know, when I ver the verbal communication of fear can result in robust fears that are going to be hard to distinguish from those that you, you learn from personal experience. Another way you learn fears is if I, for instance, I told you to watch this guy, because what he goes through is going to happen to you next. All right, so um, when we both told people that they might receive uh, a shock with a blue square or had them watch somebody, had them observe somebody else going through a fear condition procedure, we saw robust activation of the amygdala. We know that the amygdala is critical for the expression of this type of uh, social fear learning. So this tells us a simple model of fear learning applies to the social communication of fear um, some, some of these techniques for socially communicating fear, such as language, are unique to humans, and they actually, for us, are an evolutionary advantage. We don't have to experience painful experiences 
to know situations that may be dangerous to us, nevertheless, um, uh, we can acquire a fear response that depends at least in part on the same neural circuitry as fear is learned through direct experience. Um, and this suggests to us that cognitive and social means of fear learning take advantage of these phylogenetic old, phylogenetically older mechanisms of fear conditioning, and that we can build on these simple models to expand them to situations such as learning fears through language. So I've talked about the amygdala so far as a region uh, of the brain that's important um, in learning to associate uh, neutral items, uh, neutral objects, and also as evidence for people um, with aversive consequences. Um, but the amygdala, uh, and, and we know that again that type of memory is stored in the amygdala, but the amygdala is widely connected uh, with the rest of the cortex. So here's a connectivity map of the human amygdala. Um, and as you can see, the amygdala here um, looks a little bit like Grand Central Station if you're in New York City, the main train station that we have. Um, and so the amygdala is widely, has wide connections with all different parts of, of the uh, cortical, uh, the, the um, cortex that is involved in different types of higher cognition. And we can take advantage of our knowledge of the connectivity of the amygdala to gain some insights into how emotion might uh, play a role in modulating cognition. So this is a monkey brain. Um, and David Amaral has done some beautiful studies looking at the connectivity of the amygdala with visual cortical regions. And what he's shown is that you get information to the amygdala from all parts of the ventral visual stream, um, and that the amygdala also uh, has connectivity reaching back to different regions of the ventral visual stream, including early visual cortex. Um, and we know if I show you a fear face, this is research by Patrick Willemer, we will see enhanced activation of the amygdala, and Paul Whalen will probably talk about some of that later today. You will also see enhanced activation of the visual cortex, including early visual cortical regions, regions that are important in the very earliest stages of perceptual processing. Um, but if you have damage to the amygdala, you fail to see enhanced activation in early visual cort cortical regions. This suggests a model by which the amygdala gets information about the emotional significance of an event very early in visual processing, um, and then feeds back to enhance further visual processing uh, to enhance the perception, perhaps, or the attention to emotionally significant events. So we wanted to, based on this anatomy, we wanted to test the hypothesis that emotion not only influences things like can we attend to something uh, preferentially, but also does it, early, does it influence very early uh, visual processes? Something's going on here? Okay. So here's the class participation part of the lecture. I'm going to show you a little patch. In this patch, you'll see lines that are tilted to either the right or the left. And I just would like to, you to indicate if the lines are tilted to the right or the left. You're not a very good class, I have to say. Thank you, Joe. Joe's the only A student in the audience. OK, how about this one? Now we got two students. How about this one? Anybody? All right, you can't see that very well, I have to say. It looks even worse here than it does on my computer. But um, here, they are actually tilted to the left. But what I've done here is I've varied uh, contrast. I've varied the subtle gradations in, in gray. Um, and that has made it harder for you to detect uh, the orientations of the line as, we, uh, as the contrast becomes less. The contrast is a very early perceptual visual uh, feature that depends on early visual cortical regions um, uh, to resolve. So we want to test the hypothesis that emotion actually influences uh, very early visual functions, particularly your ability to detect contrast. Um, so we did an experiment where we asked subjects to fixate, and then we flashed a face, either a neutral face, um, and we now had them make that target detection task, or a fear face. And we varied the, um, the amount of contrast available in these stimuli to see uh, how much contrast do individuals need to perform correctly 82% of the time. And what we found was you needed less contract to detect the orientation of the lines 
um, if it was preceded by a fear phase than if it was preceded by a neutral phase. Um, so this tells us that emotion aids attention and perception consistent with the idea um, that something like a fear phase uh, will, a fear phase will lead to activation of the amygdala, which will then modulate further visual processing. So one of the ways emotion um, tunes cognition is to aid attention and perception for emotional events. Um, and this is, we think this is because the amygdala influence, influences sensory brain regions to ease the processing of emotional events. You need less information uh, to detect the same type of stimulus. What about memory? Um, so another thing that emotion can do to aid cognition, uh, to color our thoughts and cognitions, is to alter our memories. And most of you um, were not in New York of this day. I was. Um, but in spite of that, lots of people have memories of this day um, in the United States and around the world. Um, and we tend to, when we think about, back about our lives, uh, we tend to um, think about emotional events as having stronger memories, more vivid memories, um, than non-emotional events. So how does emotion change memory? Well, to, think, to answer that question, we have to think about the fact that memory is not a unitary process. There are three um, distinct stages to memory. Uh, information has to come in to our, uh, come into memory, so we call this stage encoding. What happens when you actually encounter the information for the first time? Then there's a, a storage process. We tend to think of this as a rather passive stage, but uh, lots of things are going on in the brain to actually make the changes in the brain that uh, that create the memory, the formation of the memory. Uh, we call these consolidation processes. And then we, the consequence of these early stages is retrieving the memory. And memories are not retrieved in an all or none fashion. Uh, sometimes we just know something occurred. Sometimes we're absolutely certain it occurred. We have confidence in some memories, not confidence in other memories. So memories have a sort of gradation on retrieval. Um, so to think about what emotion does to memory, I'm going to walk through each of these stages. I'll start with encoding. Um, so encoding is the first stage, and I've already given you a hint about what emotion does to encoding. Anything that influences how well you perceive or attend to an emotional uh, event influences what you take in and then later influences what you can remember. So all of emotion's impacts on attention and perception influence memory encoding. And I talked about one of those so far, which is um, emotion enhancing the perception of highly salient events, but a secondary function, which I didn't mention, was that emotion also impairs your ability to pay attention to other events, non-emotional events. Emotion captures our attention, making it difficult to disengage, to now focus on other details of the situation. So when information comes in, you now have very good uh, processing of a few details um, when it's something's highly emotional, and poor processing of a lot of other details when something's highly emotional. The next stage of memory is storage. Um, and again, storage seems like a passive stage. We aren't doing anything at this stage. Um, but it's not a passive stage. Uh, there are a number of processes that must occur in your brain to actually form this memory. Um, the formation of memory takes time. We call this process consolidation. Uh, this period of time where memories become more or less set in your mind. And research from animal models suggests that this consolidation process is influenced by emotion, particularly the physiological, uh, the, the physiological arousal of the neurohormonal changes that occur with arousal. So Jim McGall has done a, a, a series of beautiful studies showing how um, the, uh, the consolidation of memory, the storage of memories, are enhanced when something is highly arousing. And he's able to show that it's the storage process that's enhanced by actually creating the arousal immediately after the event occurs. Um, so it's not something that happens at the time of the event, even after the event occurs. He can manipulate arousal and show that the memories are stored more strongly. Um, and this requires the interaction of the amygdala um, and the hippocampus, which is here in orange. Um, so when, when you encounter something that's highly arousing, the amygdala modulates the hippocampal uh, consolidation, hippocampus is the brain region that's important for this type of declarative or episodic memory. Um, and this creates a situation where emotional events are more likely to be retained. Um, and so if, if emotion is influencing our ability to store 
arousing events, we should see differences in the rate of forgetting for emotional and neutral events. Um, and that has been known, that's been shown for a while. Um, so this is a, we replicated a study that was conducted in 1963, looking at the, in, the, the effect of um, time on uh, the retention interval on the um, memory for emotional events. And the way this experiment worked, this is a study I, I did when I was at Yale. Um, we had 60 Yale undergraduates come into the laboratory. They saw eight word digit pairs. So they saw a word, such as swim, and then a digit, such as eight. We measured their, their arousal response, their skin conductance response, while they were reading the words. We then divided up the words based on each individual subject's arousal response to the words into high arousal and low arousal words. Then we, we showed them the word and we asked them to recall the digit that was paired with the words. For half the subjects, we did this immediately after they saw the words and digits. For the other half, we did it 24 hours later. And this is what we observed. So here, in the, the white line here, is the digits paired with low arousal words. And what you see is what you might forget, forgetting over time. Um, this is just a standard pattern of forgetting that's been observed over and over and over again. We remember more things immediately than we do after a delay. For the digits paired with high arousal words, you actually had slightly better memory over time. Um, so you remember digits paired with high arousal words much better after delay. Um, and even somewhat better than you might immediately. This is just three studies we've done looking at memory for highly arousing uh, information. This is the data I just showed you. This is looking at memory for uh, arousing words, sort of dirty words, words you shouldn't say in public. Um, this is looking at memory for uh, highly arousing scenes. And if I just looked at memory immediately, I would see three different patterns of performance. But over time, what we see is we always retain the highly arousing information uh, more. So what I've suggested to you so far, can't see these things, is that um, emotion changes the encoding of information so that you have very good processing for a few details, poor processing for a lot of details. But the details that get in now are stored more strongly. Um, and this has a consequence on the retrieval of memories. And this notion of, re of having this variation in retrieval of memories is a little difficult to study in, in other species. I can't ask another species, uh, you know, how strongly, how confident are you in your memory? I can measure performance on a memory test, um, but this feeling that I really know something, um, that, you know, I have a vivid sense when I retrieve this memory is something that we might, uh, we, we can only really ask about in humans. Um, and what do we know about the retrieval of emotional memory? So if we look back to memories for things like 9-11, um, people have described memories for these types of events as flashbulb memories. So flashbulb memories are memories for highly arousing events. And this term was, was developed by two research, re researchers named Brown and Kulik in the 1970s. And they studied things like the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, Malcolm X, and they asked people to describe these memories. And when people describe their memories for these highly emotional events, um, they describe the details of where they were, who they were with, what they were wearing, um, you know, what happened next, um, and the, a level of detail that was somewhat surprising for a regular memory. And so Brown and Kulik argued that when something's highly arousing, it's almost as if your memory is a picture taken with a flashbulb, and that people were just reading off these memories. Um, and so this term, flashbulb memories, has come to describe our memories for highly emotional events. What's interesting, however, is that in spite of the fact that individuals, when they recall these types of events, describe a lot of detail and have a lot of confidence that their memory is, is accurate, since the 1970s, there have been uh, hundreds of, not hundreds, probably 800 studies um, that have examined accuracy for these types of memories and found that in spite of the fact that people are highly confident their memories are correct, uh, they usually are pretty wrong in a lot of the details. So here's just one example of a study like that. This was a study but done by David Rubin at Duke University. And on September 12, 2001, he managed to bring uh, undergraduates into the laboratory. And he asked them to write down 
what they were doing when they heard about the terrorist attack of 9-11, um, and also to come up with another event that happened uh, that day or the day before, such as meeting friends to study or going to dinner, and describe the details of these events as well. He then brought them back to the laboratory a year later and said, tell me your recollections. Tell me your recollections of 9-11. Tell me your recollections of this other event that occurred. And what he found was memories for 9-11 were no more accurate in their details one year later than memories for other events. Both declined over time. What was different, however, is that uh, the subjects were highly confident that their memories for the details of their memories for 9-11 were correct. You can't convince individuals that they don't know what they were doing on 9-11. Um, but often, even though you can't convince them that their, detail, their memories are incorrect, uh, if we measure their memory over time, we're going to see that their memory has changed. Um, for sort of mundane life events, individuals were not highly confident that, that their memories were correct. So no greater accuracy for memories of details, just differences in this uh, sense this, the, of recollection, this, this notion that your memories are, 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 are accurate uh, and detailed. So why does this occur? So we, for, to get some information, to get some insight into why we might have uh, different judgments about our memory confidence in spite of uh, no difference in memory accuracy for details, um, we did a brain imaging study where we showed people images like this and images like this. Um, and we showed them these images before they went into the brain scanner. We asked them uh, when they were in the scanner to tell us if they saw this image before and to tell us if they remember it with a sense of recollection, of detail, or they just seems kind of familiar to them. You know, it's just something they, that happened before. And what we found what, uh, in terms of the behavior, which has been shown before, is that emotion enhances the likelihood that you're going to say, I have a strong sense of recollection. Uh, I'm gonna, I, have, I know a lot of details of that memory. We, when we looked at the brain to say, what are the brain regions that differentiate um, judging a memory as sort of very uh, vivid and, and with a lot of details versus uh, just sort of knowing that it occurred, we saw for the neutral uh, slides, for the neutral scenes, we saw a differentiation in this region here. This is the parahippocampus. It's uh, right underneath the hippocampus, which is here. The hippocampus is important uh, for this type of memory. If you have damage to the hippocampus, you don't really remember very much. The parahippocampus also plays a role in memory for events. Um, but the parahippocampus, we know, is important for memory for visual details, um, for contextual details. And not surprisingly, when we ask people to make this memory judgment, do you recollect this with a lot of contextual details, what we saw was increased brain activation. This is the uh, blood oxidation level dependent signal that you see with functional magnetic resonance imaging um, in this parahippocampal region which makes a lot of sense. We asked them for memory for details, uh, you know, for, to recollect a memory of details. We see a region of the brain that we know is important in those types of contextual details showing more activation when they make that judgment versus just saying they kind of knew they were, it was familiar, but, it didn't, but they didn't have a lot of details. Interestingly, for the emotional events, this brain region didn't make that differentiation. The brain region that differentiated uh, these memories with a lot of details versus the ones that didn't have a lot of details for emotional events was the amygdala. So here we see increased blood oxygenation level, dependent signal, bold signal. In the amygdala, when subjects are telling us they have a lot of details for these emotional events, um, as opposed to uh, just ha having them be familiar, and that was not the case for the neutral events. So we see a double dissociation. We see that different brain systems underlie the same mnemonic judgment. I'm asking everybody to tell me, do you recollect this with a lot of details? But different parts of the brain seem to be linked to that same judgment. We asked, we did the same thing by bringing people who were in New York on 9-11 uh, into the brain scanner. We asked them to retrieve memories from 9-11 versus other life events that occurred at that time. Um, and this is just an example of one of the memories from 9-11. Someone said, uh, the explosion caused everyone in the area to automatically duck for cover. I saw some scaffolding that I could go under to avoid the falling debris. I saw with my own eyes the towers burning in red flames, movie, uh, noises and cries of people. 
when we had people, when we looked at the brain to say what brain regions differentiate recalling memories from 9-11 versus other life events, we saw the same pattern, increased amygdala activation when recalling 9-11 versus other life events, increased activation of the, um, the parahippocampus when they're recalling other life events versus 9-11 uh, memories. Um, and this goes along with the differences we see in the confidence and memory accuracy more than accuracy. So what do we think is going on here? Well, as I've suggested to you so far, when information comes in, um, when it's highly emotional, we have very strong uh, perception for a few details, but actually less encoding of other details. So this is what comes into the memory system. Then those few details are stored more strongly. So you end up with an emotional event where you have very strong memory for a couple details, worse memory for a lot of other details. Um, and what we think happens is that you now mistake this very strong memory for a few details uh, for memory for a lot of other details as well. Um, so emotion enhances the storage of events, the amygdala influences the consolidation of arousing events, and we may not remember all the details of emotional events, even if we think we do. We think we have very strong memories for a few details, and now we mistake that for good memory for a lot of details. And you might ask, why would we ever evolve to have this occur? So um, confidence in a memory uh, allows us to, to believe that memory is accurate and use that information now to act in the future. One of the purposes of memory is to be able to take your past and inform your future decisions. If you're not confident in the memory that you have, you're less likely to act on it. You're more likely to seek out other information to help confirm that you're doing the right thing. Um, so we think this increased confidence for emotional memory, in spite of the fact that all the details may not be correct, all the details are often probably not that important. It's usually just the primary few events that occurred that may be important uh, to think about what that event might mean for future actions, and that this increased confidence for emotional memories may help us act more quickly in the future based on these uh, memories of the past. So I want to now, um, I've talked a little bit about how emotional events, uh, that e events acquire emotional significance. I've talked a little bit about how once something has some emotional significance, it can then tune your cognition, your attention, and your memory. Um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, emotions should be flexible so that things that are emotional, you have emotional responses to today, you should not always have emotional responses to. So we also, once we've acquired, somebody's acquired emotional significance, we should be able to change that uh, emotional significance. Um, and so the last part of my talk, I want to talk about how we can change a fear response once, we, once we've acquired it. Um, I'm going to talk about three different techniques we can use. The first Joe talked about last night, and this is extinction learning. So extinction is simply repeated exposure to learned fear stimulus with no aversive consequences resulting in a diminished fear response. In the US, we have a term called getting back on the horse. Um, and what this means is when you're afraid of something, your natural response is to avoid that situation. Um, and it, what happens when you avoid the situation is you know, never give yourself an opportunity to have a new experience with that situation or event um, that is safe, and therefore you never have the opportunity to get over this fear. And, we, and uh, this is talked about when you fall off a horse, you should get back on the horse. Um, as Joe suggested last night, this results in new learning that the condition stimulus is now safe. You, it's not that we've erased the fear memory. We've now created a second memory that the stimulus that used to be uh, dangerous is no longer dangerous, this is safe. And those two memories compete for expression uh, uh, so that the fear memory might now come back in, at times when the extinction memory is not being expressed. And this forms the basis for exposure therapy treatment uh, of phobias. And that's illustrated here. You may not be able to read this, but it says, Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark. Yeah, I'm not a therapist, but I don't think that's quite right. So again, in thinking about how we uh, diminish these fears, we want to start with thinking about what we know from animal models, where we know quite a bit more about the brain systems that might be involved in this type of um, uh, technique for getting rid of fears than we do in humans. Um, and this is a slide I borrowed from Greg Quirk. And I just want to highlight two parts of this slide. So there's some evidence uh, from Mike Davis uh, 
that the amygdala plays a, a role in the acquisition of extinction, um, but for the expression of extinction over time, we need the ventral medial prefrontal cortex to retain this extinction learning uh, and express, uh, to inhibit the amygdala so that we can express the extinction memory and inhibit the initial fear memory. So the first thing we wanted to do was say, can we find evidence in humans for the engagement of similar brain systems uh, involved in um, the expression of extinction memory, specifically the, the medial prefrontal cortex, which we know inhibits the amygdala to allow the expression of the extinction memory. So extinction uh, learning in humans occurs much like you would expect. Again, we went back to our blue squares, paired them with a mild shock to the wrist, created a, a, a fear memory of the blue square. With extinction, we simply presented the blue square over and over and over again until the fear response was diminished. We did this immediately after subjects acquired the fear, um, and then we also brought them back a day later to look at the retention of fear learning um, and to, to have further extinction learning. So this is our data from extinction. I've plotted here. This is the skin conductance response. Um, I've plotted here. This is the stimulus that was paired with shock in the darker bar and the stimulus not paired with shock in the lighter bar. Um, and here we see subjects acquire the fear response. Uh, when we over, go through the first session of extinction, they somewhat diminish their fear response. Here we see this is what we call spontaneous recovery. With the passage of time, the fear returns, even though we have an extinction memory. Um, but with, with the passage of time, we see that the, the, the fear memory comes back. But again, we continue, continue extinction until the end. We see no differential response uh, to the condition stimulus that was paired with shock versus the one that was not. When we look in the brain, we see a region that we think is analogous to the infralimbic cortex in rats, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, that shows an increase in activation when you acquire an extinction memory. When we look in the amygdala, what we see, um, not surprisingly, is an increase in amygdala activation when you're acquiring a fear, but the, we see this diminished uh, amygdala activation when you're extinguishing the fear response. So this is just very consistent with what we expect from non-human animals. That we know the amygdala is involved in the acquisition, storage, and expression of this type of learning. Uh, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex plays a role in the inhibition uh, of the amygdala in order to allow the expression of extinction learning. However, humans um, have other ways of diminishing their fear responses. Um, you can, instead of just exposing yourself repeatedly to, uh, to a fearful stimulus, you can also use your thoughts to help change your emotional responses. Um, so we call this emotion regulation, and here we're reevaluating a stimulus associated with negative affect uh, into positive emotional terms. I call this the glasses half full approach. You can view this glass as either half full or half empty. Um, and this forms the basis for cognitive therapy. And this is just illustrated here. Um, and this was actually a slide taken to teach children to use these types of cognitive uh, regulation techniques. Um, you see two cats looking at the same dog with very different emotional responses. And it just essentially says how we appraise the situation can be a major determinant of our emotional reaction. In the laboratory, we did it something like this. Um, again, we showed simple geometric shapes of different colors. One was paired with shock, one was never paired with shock. Um, but, but prior to the scanning session, individuals were given two different instructions. They, were, if they saw the word attend right before seeing one of these stimuli, they were told to focus on their natural feelings. If they saw the word regulate, they were, tried, they were told to use the color of the square to come up with an image to them that from, from nature that was soothing. Uh, and they practiced this ahead of time. They could come up with anything they wanted, um, but they had, to, they had to be able to generate this image when prompted. Um, and so if it was a blue square, you might think of a beautiful water scene, a yellow square, something like a field of daisies. Subjects were able to do this to diminish their arousal responses to the stimulus that predicted shock. So here, uh, I've plotted the skin conductance response to the stimulus paired with shock when subjects attend to its emotional significance versus regulate, uh, regulate their emotional response. When we look in the amygdala, um, what we see, much like we saw with extinction learning, an increase in response in the amygdala when you're attending to the significance of the emotional events, 
a decrease in response when you're regulating the significance of the emotional event. And here I've just plotted the, the data from the extinction learning and the emotion regulation next to each other, and we see a very similar pattern. When I look for regions in the prefrontal cortex that may play a role in diminishing your emotional responses through your thoughts, through your cognitions, um, I see two regions that show more activation when you're regulating versus, uh, ex versus attending. One is this region of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is a region that often shows up in studies of emotion regulation. It's a region that we think is important in the online manipulation uh, or interpretation of the emotional significance of the event. Um, it's, it's often invoked in studies of, of executive control. And we also see activation of this region of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex that looks very much like what we saw in extinction learning. And we know that there's not a lot of connectivity between the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, that most of its connectivity to the amygdala comes through regions like the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, so we think that we're using this region to then um, engage the same circuitry that we might be engaging during extinction learning. Um, and there was some evidence of that, here I've plotted responses in this region when we're both extinguishing our emotional responses or regulating our emotional responses. And in both cases, we see an increase in activation in this region uh, when you're diminishing your emotional response through either passive extinction or using your thoughts. So this, again, uh, suggests a model where the amygdala is involved in the expression of this fear learning. The ventral mini prefrontal cortex plays a role in the inhibition of the amygdala to allow the expression of either extinction learning or to enable your thoughts now to diminish your emotional responses. So what I suggested to you so far is that the control of fear requires a network of regions. Uh, once you've acquired a fear response, we can change this fear response by controlling the amygdala through uh, the, 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 uh, the amygdala through the prefrontal cortex and also the hippocampus, which I, which I didn't talk about here. Um, but that fear memory, it still exists, that initial fear memory. Um, and we know this because fears can return through things like spontaneous recovery, the passage of time, uh, when someone is stressed um, or in, their, in, the, they're in the, an appropriate context, the fear comes back. So the fear memory is still there. Um, I, I don't know if any of you, if this movie ever made it to Poland, but that was the premise behind this movie. It's the second Jaws installment. And they said, once you thought it was safe to go back in the water, the shark came back. Um, and we wanted to ask a question then, is there a way to persistently alter fear? So here, we again drew on uh, research in non-human animals, um, looking at this process called reconsolidation. So reconsolidation is when a previously created long-term memory is brought back to a fragile or labile state by re-exposure or reactivation of the memory. So let me just walk you through uh, what reconsolidation uh, suggests about memory storage. So this is how we traditionally think memory works. You learn something. We have this storage process that I've already talked about called consolidation that takes a period of time for the memory to become more or less set in your mind. Um, after you've stored a memory, when you retrieve the memory, You've, restored that, you've retrieved that initial memory. If you then retrieve the memory a second time, you still retrieve the same memory. This is the traditional view of memory. The reconsolidation view suggests that when we learn something, we have this period of time where the memory is stored, the consolidation period, where the memory is somewhat fragile and could be disrupted before it's completely stored. Once it's stored, when you retrieve it, you have another period of storage. Uh, and we call this reconsolidation. Um, and so now when you retrieve it a, second, a, a third time, you're not retrieving the initial memory, you're retrieving memories that was updated with new information at the time of the first retrieval. Um, but this suggests there's a second time window where memories are fragile, where you could potentially disrupt a memory and prevent its storage or restorage in this case. Um, and this was shown to be done in rats. So a study in Joe Ledoux's lab done by Karine Nader, uh, Nader, Nader in, published in 2000, uh, had rats conditioned to fear a tone. They let that uh, fear memory consolidate. They then brought rats back. They had them retrieve the fear memory by, play, by hearing the tone. And during this second consolidation process or reconsolidation process, they injected into the lateral amygdala a protein synthesis inhibitor, which is necessary for the processes that, uh, that, that, that are involved in the storage of that memory. 
And what they found is, later on is that there was no evidence that the memory existed. Um, in other words, the memory wasn't expressed again. Um, and so it seemed as if they completely persistently blocked the fear memory uh, by this procedure, by manipulating this reconsolidation window. And this is very exciting. It suggests now you can permanently, I should say persistently, change memories. The problem is you can't inject these drugs into the lateral amygdala in humans. It's not safe. Um, so we wanted to think about a different approach to do this. Um, reconsolidation, if it exists, didn't exist so that we can now disrupt memories by injecting drugs into the lateral amygdala. It, it exists for a purpose, and one of those purposes perhaps is to update memories, memories constantly being updated. So um, when you retrieve a memory, information that's available at the time of retrieval through reconsolidation can now be stored with that memory uh, to create a more, uh, an updated memory, um, including not just the original uh, information, but new information. And if this is the case, maybe we can introduce new information during the reconsolidation window to persistently change uh, the memory in a long-term fashion. Um, and so the question was, can we update the memory with new information about the value of the stimulus? So we did this by, again, having subjects learn to fear something simple like a blue square. We then had them retrieve that memory. And while the memory was being restored, we now presented information suggesting this blue square was safe. What we found in that case, so here I'm just going to walk you through this, um, the yellow, uh, the white bar here is the, is the group that got this new learning uh, during the reconsolidation period. And what we see is that all three groups are able to acquire a fear memory, extinguish a fear memory, but the fear returns, comes back, only in subjects who did not get this safety learning while the, the restorage process was occurring. And we found that this effect, a year later, we brought the subjects back and found that we found no evidence of the fear memory even after a year in these subjects. So in other words, we were able to update the fear memory by introducing safety information while the memory is being restored and persistently change the, the value um, of the condition stimulus and diminish the expression of the fear memory. This is very exciting. We don't know at this point, however, if this reconsolidation update mechanism will be useful in, tr in changing more complex memories, the types that might be linked to anxiety disorders. So what I suggested to you today is that we can use research from non-human animals to provide insights into emotion in the human brain, and not just doing things that are uh, clearly analogous between, uh, between animals, other animals and humans, but now extending these models to situations that are more typical of human experience. And I suggested to you that the, uh, the amygdala is critical for the associative classical fear conditioning that we see, but also for social means of fear learning that may be unique to humans. Um, that we can look at the connectivity of the amygdala and get some insight into how emotion colors thoughts and actions, and that the amygdala's extensive connectivity with other brain regions enables emotions modulation of perception, attention, and memory. And that cortical inputs to the amygdala and the amygdala's memory storage processes can alter the emotional significance of events. So I have to thank uh, my lab members who did all the work today, that I presented today, former students and postdoc, collaborators, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.